There are two faces to the city of Chicago. First, you see its spectacular downtown next to Lake Michigan with its famous theaters and incredible architecture. Top that off with some of the most passionate sports fans in the country. You get the picture. But the other face of Chicago is known for its violence and the thousands of lives lost in recent years. One child is killed in Chicago every week. And this is the face of Chicago that seems to dominate the headlines and the national conversations surrounding the city. You walk down the street, you get shot. In Chicago, they've had thousands of shootings, thousands. And I'm saying, where is this? Is this a war-torn country? But this narrative of carnage, of endemic violence, is incomplete. I know this because I'm from Chicago. It's a beautifully diverse place with a population almost evenly split between Black, White, and Latino Americans. But Chi-Town is also one of the most racially divided cities in the United States. Most of these ethnic groups live in different neighborhoods separated by geography. Segregation is like air and water. We just live it, we just breathe it, we don't really think about it. It's just sort of how things are. I wanted to find out how Chicago got this way and how its segregation led to so many of its problems. Chicago's segregation is best explained on a map. You have your north side, you have your south side, and you have your west side. To the east is the lake. Those terms, north, south, and west, have subtle meanings that relate to the racial segregation of Chicago. And so when you say the north side, people are sometimes subtly meaning the white side. And the south side, especially today, is predominantly black. And so when you say the south side, you are subtly meaning the black side. Chicago is very territorial. Like for me growing up, it was okay, I know not to go to Bridgeport. Like this is a place that's not really welcoming to African-Americans. This geographic segregation is no accident. It was engineered over years of deliberate policies. In the early 1900s, Chicago was largely a city of white immigrants. The Great Migration of the 20th century brought millions of black Americans out of the violent Jim Crow South hoping for a better life. By the end of the 1940s, nearly half a million black Americans lived in Chicago, mostly in a small corridor on the South Side called the Black Belt. As the black population increased, they faced housing practices that were completely racist and yet completely legal. One of the worst was a practice called redlining, which allowed banks to refuse home loans to black residents wanting to move into mostly white neighborhoods. This happened to cities nationwide, from Chicago to Oakland to Baltimore. Realtors and homeowners signed restrictive covenants saying they wouldn't sell to black families in those white neighborhoods. And after World War II, the federal government subsidized white veterans with low interest loans for fresh new homes in suburbia, complete with big yards and highways to get there. The federal government was basically saying neighborhoods that are racially integrated are, a high, are high risk neighborhoods and so we're not going to insure those mortgages in those neighborhoods. Um, so they were um, supporting a suburbanization that led to predominantly white suburbs and predominantly black urban neighborhoods. Meanwhile, realtors often participated in shady practices. There were brokers that would go into a block and they may move a minority female with her four or five or six children into a two bedroom house. And they would go down the block telling folks, well, they're here, your values are going to depreciate, your daughters will be raped, and which meant now what we can do is we can help you get out of here before it's too late. Brokers would cheat those white homeowners by buying those homes at a low price, and then turn around and cheat the black homeowners by selling them those same homes at an inflated rate. These practices continued even after the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which made it illegal to refuse to sell or finance a home based on someone's race. But not all realtors were so deceptive. Frank, who opened his real estate office in 1971, has often been credited with integrating the Beverly neighborhood on Chicago's south side. Our office windows were being broken, and there was demonstrations, uh, and that very year, uh, the community organization was asking that I would sign an anti-solicitation list, which meant that I would not solicit nor sell within those communities. But Frank refused to back down and continued to sell to black families. The neighborhood retaliated. Mobs marched on his real estate office. Neighborhood ladies would call and tie up his phone lines all day long so he couldn't get business. Frank was investigated multiple times over the years in an effort to stop his work. 
And things got worse when Frank and his wife, who's white, decided to buy their own home. I was prepared to do what was necessary to buy it, but we rejected for our loan. They still managed to buy it, and a year later, in 1975, that home was targeted. It was one evening, uh, I guess about, about 8 o'clock, you know, the sun was going down, etc. And, uh, you know, my wife and I and the two girls and, and our, and our uh, number two son was in the house. Number one son had not gotten home yet. And boom, at the front door. That was a bomb, a Molotov cocktail, you know, that was placed, you know, within the mailbox and boom. Frank's family survived the incident, but the front of the house was destroyed and the kids who placed the bomb, they were never prosecuted. So if black families couldn't get loans to move to the suburbs or white neighborhoods in the city, what was left for them? Black folks were living in the older parts of the city where overcrowding had very much led to the deterioration of housing in black neighborhoods. And so black Chicagoans needed decent, safe, affordable housing. The answer in the post-war era was public housing. Public housing was welcome. These were brand new buildings built in a style that at that time was awesome. These high rises with elevators and with big green spaces in, in front of them. So public housing began as paradise for many families. It was an escape from what was deteriorating housing after many decades of overcrowding. Um, so that was the golden age of public housing in the 1940s, 50s, early 60s. But these paradises were also isolating, and by the 70s and 80s, these high-rises became as bad as the housing they sought to replace, with a concentration of poverty that led to violence, gangs, and drug abuse. As a result, support for public housing waned. Through their sheer force of humanity had to maintain their own community because the city and the federal government had very much abandoned them. I remember these high-rise buildings like Cabrini Green and the Robert Taylor homes, which everyone called the projects. Family and friends told us not to go there. My high school English teacher called them prisons for the poor. In 2000, the city started demolishing them to try to clean up the neighborhoods. But today, while the projects may be gone, many of the people who lived in them are still suffering from the effects of poverty. What happens is that people think that this is only a Chicago issue. You know, Baltimore, Detroit, Philadelphia, urban places in this country are all dealing with these same issues, a leg legacy of segregation that has roots in housing, inequity, and violence comes along with that. These cities continue to suffer from their divisions. From 1955 to 1970, 62% of blacks and only 4% of whites across America were raised in poor neighborhoods. Half a century later, those numbers haven't changed. Yes, the whites only signs are gone and the rate of black poverty has decreased. But the scars of a segregated city run deep from poor healthcare access to lack of jobs and yes, violence. And all of this makes me wonder, how do these color lines affect the city's most vulnerable, its kids? Chicago is so segregated that more than half of the city's black population lives in 20 of its 77 communities. In the next video, we'll take a look at what segregation does to a city and how it affects the lives of those living there.